Thanks, guys. Thanks, worship team. That was awesome. Thank you. You may be wondering why I'm standing here with Amy. Um, Brad asked me to pray for Amy um, to cover her yesterday because Brad's on holidays. Um, and I thought, heck yes, I would be honoured to do that. Um, it's the least I could do for somebody who spoke so much encouragement into my life. And at the perfect time, Amy's had the perfect words for me. <laughs> and I want to bless you and honour you from myself and my family. And, and I'm sure most of you here would have felt very similar at some point in time. Um, so if out of your honour as a family, as wonderful as you all are, would you that she is to all of us, we thank you, Lord, for, we thank you, Lord, that she's back and she's here and she's speaking to, to all of us. We thank you, Lord, for, we thank you, Lord, that she's back and she's here and she's speaking to us today. We're all very back and she's here and she's speaking to us today. We're all very excited about that. And Lord, I just, we just pray a blessing over her. We just pray for everything that you would have for her, Lord. We pray we pray that it would be received and and we were praying this before the service this morning and we just pray we just pray that prophetic word received lord we just pray it over amy's life we just pray for her heart's desires we pray for her health we pray for everything that you would have for her today tomorrow and for her future lord and that it would just be bright and amazing and exciting and that we could be a part of it and that we could celebrate with her as well lord and we just pray that she would just be at complete peace and rest as she brings this word. Um, and Lord, that you would just be with her in Jesus' name. Thank Amen. you, everybody. Thank you, Grant. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. Good morning. It was just such a precious, precious time in the worship. Thank you so much. It really felt like hope and entered the room. And his goodness is what brings the hope, yeah? It's beautiful to rest in that. Um, yeah, so my name's Amy. I'm on staff here as one of the associate pastors. I've been on a bit of a break, a bit of a hiatus. Some of it a bit forced from health conditions, which eventually led to a burnout middle of the year. And I'm just so grateful for the grace I've been given from this church. This is a church that doesn't use people. And I just was given complete rest. Um, the other part of it is I've been in transition from one role to another. So I used to oversee um, more of the pastoral care side of this church, the families, life clubs, all of that. And that's been transitioned over to Kylie Holt and her team um, just over the last few months. And I am starting to dream into the Transformation Centre and a prayer ministry centre on the property. Uh, the Lord showed me a year ago that he'd given me a, a scroll and it was a blueprint for the Transformation Centre. And he said to me, and I don't require you to open it. And he spent a whole year telling me over and over again, I require nothing of you. I require nothing of you. And just allowing me to rest between seasons. And, you know, sometimes the land is um, got seeds in it other times land has its growth of crop other times it's harvest time and then there's a time where the land needs to completely rest and get nutrients back in it again kind of knows i'm a weeper and um, get nutrients back in it again and that's where i've been i've just known that the land needed to rest before i could seed anything for the future i was like don't even i remember brad and lisa were walking the ground so what do you think and i just went it's like I'm a young mum who's had all these young children. I've been wiping bottoms for 10 years. They're finally at school. Don't you dare talk to me about another baby. <laughs> I was just like, it, we're done. <laughs> so I was like, we're not going into dreaming, into anything. And I've been given a beautiful year from the Lord of just, I require nothing of you. The builder in me got to rest. And I'm just so grateful. And so thank you for your grace as well. Um, I have not felt demand from this community. And I really love you. I've missed some of your hearts. I've been watching from a distance, different journeys different breakdowns different breakthroughs and yeah I'm just excited for you I feel there's some new members of our family that have come in sort of in the last few months and I've missed out on connecting hearts with you so I look forward to slowly uh, learning you and you learning me 
across the future, but welcome to the family. Um, yeah, I've been nervous that I'll be a bit rusty. It's earlier, earlier in the year, I think, was the last time I spoke. But you have been on the Lord's heart. I've spent the last few weeks with him just impressing where some of you are at, and it's been my high honour to carry some of that and to listen. And some of it's been my own journey as well. I felt like it's not just where I've been at, I feel like it's been corporate, and it's just been dropping. I've been doing my makeup or the shower or going for a walk, and he's just my people, my people's hearts. And so I've just been listening, and he is so after you. This week, exactly a year ago, so on the 12th of December, so three days ago, a year ago, there was a Wednesday prayer set. It was uh, Rachel, I think Nicole, probably Andrew, I think Ali was there, and myself. And in that time, there was a quite prophetic picture that Rachel in particular was picking up and we prayed into. And that has become the message of the prophetic word re-released as the new year went over. And it was, no more delay. And the Lord's been saying, can you speak to my people's hearts? Because some of them are still in delay. There's delay that has breakthrough coming, but he's just like, can we just shepherd hearts here? Can we, can we go back to that word? It's the last Sunday of this year. And uh, when we gave that word, Rachel and I shared that sermon time and gave that prophetic word. It was really gutsy. It's really gutsy to, on record, be saying, Jesus says... The Jesus who actually does a lot of waiting, he did a lot of waiting in the word, and the Lord God who uses waiting all the way through the scripture, as I've been learning on my waiting journey, he is so, he, it's like one of his biggest things he uses to gather up our hearts, to gather up whether we can trust him, to build depth in us. He uses waiting seasons, but there's always a breakthrough. Victory is the only biblical outcome for every one of us. Does every part of your heart know that? Does every part of your heart know that? We can have unbelieving parts of our hearts, we really can. Even in scripture it talks about a divided heart. We can have parts of our hearts that don't truly believe that breakthrough is for us. We believe in the God of the breakthrough we sing and Hosanna and we love you, but maybe not for me. And he wanted me to talk to you about facing delay. So we're going to face it. We're going to go there. We're going to get in there. And so I encourage you, if your story has been a lot of waiting and delay in different areas of your life, put your seatbelt on because we're going there uh, this morning. If it's not part of your story, can I encourage you to gather understanding because there'll be people in your life, perhaps people in your biological family, that it's their journey. And for us to shepherd each other is really the Lord's heart. Is that all right? Okay. So facing delay. So we all got this at the beginning of the year. There's a picture of it on the screen. At the end, if you didn't get one, just know that there's a few more on the info table. Or when we release this message on Facebook, maybe in the comments underneath we'll put a photo of that so you can print that off or keep that. But this triggered things for people because some people really couldn't open it for a while. It came closed and the word on it is received. So I have in the spirit received what has been a delay that's a big gutsy thing to go but jesus was like it's time it's done can i remind you of the prophetic word one year ago so it was the 12th of december um and we were worshiping and we were praying i think we were singing um yahweh god of my strength god of my song and rachel said oh there's an exhausted army and she could hear the marching. This was all prophetically done. This was a prophetic word the Lord dropped. And she could hear an exhausted army, and they were coming. She could hear the stomping. They were exhausted. She wasn't sure who they were. Was it our community? Is it regionally? Is it nationally? Is it the body of Christ? It felt like armies of heaven choosing to come and join and trudge alongside the weary soldiers. So as we were worshipping, angels were being released. Heaven choosing to come and join and trudge alongside the weary soldiers. So as we were worshipping, angels were being released to just come. So as we were worshipping, angels were being released to just come and come alongside exhausted warriors. And then Rachel felt out of her gut the sentence which she felt jesus said was make it now by faith interesting sentence make it now by faith make it now now what was now 
And then immediately she looked up and we were worshipping and she felt that in the heavens it was thousands of the back of letter boxes. So not the front where the letter goes in, the back where the padlock is, maybe you have that at home, thousands of the back of the letter boxes. And so we just felt to, to pray into the things that have been locked up, the things that have been delayed, the things that heaven has heard and have been stored up and haven't been released yet. And as we prayed and we worshipped into that, all of these padlocks came off and thousands upon thousands of envelopes fell onto the floor. That was the prophetic picture. And Jesus was like, it's time. And he said, no more delay. And then he invited us to partner with receiving the breakthrough. That's quite different to just hearing him say, no more delay. But for our hearts to partner with that truth, that takes some um, courage, takes some vulnerability, and it takes all the parts of our hearts choosing to actually receive the truth that breakthrough is for us. I've known that a whole bunch of people have kept this in their wallets this year, or in their Bible, or in their car, on the table, I had mine um, mounted. Has it challenged you? Later, I'm going to share only a smidgen of some of the breakthroughs that have happened in our community this year. There are so many, so many. It's actually been happening. Big things that have been long term waited for. Lots of marriages having restoration or people meeting people. Um, we've had some babies pregnancies there's been major breakthroughs when it comes to what we want that's not what this is about this is not referring to I really want that and we declare the item Jesus really isn't about I just want to indulge them with every tiny thing that'll help them keep little addictions on the side so this is not referring to false refuges that you want and can you please give them to me Jesus this is referring to long-term areas of breakthrough and desire desires of our heart do all the parts of our heart believe that he cares about the desires the desires for our, our marriage to be reconciled or there's a list I'm going to go over about what waiting can be but what I've been learning is when he actually provides into that very space that we've had long-term desire, out of that, we actually realize we received Jesus. He's the gift. So remember my story at the beginning of the year, I talked about all of this incredible miracle of the provision of my car and my house. And the, the house was literally a day after I said to Jesus, well, my heart's desire would to be in a you know, long, narrow flute house in Baldivis, you know, across from a park with a master bedroom at the back. And I just went on the day later, it began, and I have everything my heart desired. And it's not because I wanted false refuge. Or He's like, yeah, you've had displacement as your story. Placement is important for your heart. You don't have a husband and children, a woman, and, and have a home and somewhere to nest. And he just went into the desires of my heart and gave me such dignity through this house. Went into the desires of my heart and gave me such dignity through this house. But the list went on and on, do you remember? Well, if I really got my dream, I would have a big copper butler sink. Oh, the company don't do that. Sorry, we don't do butler sinks. Well, if I really had my heart's desire, and I just listed, I've got it all. I've got the butler sink. I've got the freestanding bath. I've got the things that minister and are beautiful. And, and every tiny thing, even sometimes the company would make a mistake, hence the sink, and come back to me and go, we made a mistake. What would you like? Just as our way of fixing it. Right up to the end where I had... I wasn't allowed to spend on at pre-start on the last things. You know, you're only allowed one or two thousand because of the company of finance I went through. Then they made a big mistake. So they came back to me, okay, we'll extend it to 20,000. You know, you can have, you know, we're sorry. I'm like, <laughs> I didn't have 20,000. But I did go and meet with people who are in housing and in what it's worth and everything. And I did take out a small personal loan to go more than just the nothingness. Because Jesus was like, what's your heart's desire? What's your heart's desire? And what did I get out of that? 
I didn't get, oh, now I love my home, I got, now I love Jesus, because I didn't know Jesus meets heart's desires. That part of my heart didn't know that Jesus can give. My story's been a lot of Jesus asking me to bow, Jesus asking me to wait, Jesus asking me to just hold on, Jesus going, in lack, will you love me? And then he's going, what about if I'm a giver? And what about if you get your complete heart's desire? Do you know me that way? So he actually loves to indulge us in the very things that he probably put in our heart because we learn he is a gift in ways we never knew. So that has been really special. So I was sharing that testimony at the beginning of the year. So the types of delay in our community, outside of our community, just in case this is someone in your family, someone in your community, just so you're learning, people can be in deep delay and it feels like an ongoing grief. It's like a grater, a cheese grater against your heart and against your spirit. It really is. In things that just won't budge no matter what you do, it's like a greater going over you. And it can be financial pressure ongoing, ongoing. Hey, sometimes there's blockages and it's to, do, it's to do with other things like you know Freemasonry or um, things in the root system that need prayer ministry. So there can be reasons for blockages, but there can just be delay for financial breakthrough. There can be difficult relationships or a relationship loss altogether. Physical affliction that won't change, sickness, disease in you or your loved one. These can be types of delay. Family turmoil that just goes on and on. It's like a greater. Unexpressed ministry gifting. Part of you that just knows what you're born for and there's a delay in that. Joseph in jail. John the Baptist in jail while Jesus is ministering. Hello, John had a lot <laughs> going. Like, it's just... It's just delay. What does that reveal? Um, unattained goals. Just can't get to where our heart's desires. Prolonged grief. That can be through a loss, a loss of country, a loss of a person, a loss of health. Um, heart healing. Doesn't matter what you do, there's just internal pain. That's been a lot of my story. So I went through a wilderness that sort of ended when I was 35. So a good 15 years of just internal pain. And some of it was you know, really because of circumstances that I was in, but the Lord didn't release. He wanted me to walk that through and to learn all the parts of my heart and to learn all the parts of his heart. And maybe you're on a heart journey and it's just so long. It's okay. That's actually part of the purpose. It's part of the delay. There's something in that. Um, ongoing battles with addiction, emotional upheaval. There's unfulfilled desires. There's lack of vision or desire. Some people, they, they're going up and they're going through life and then they're in their 20s or in their 30s, they're like, I actually don't dream. I don't have a dream. I don't know what I'm here for. And to go on and on with that is actually a type of delay. It really can great, can be tricky. Great or ongoing personal loss. L barrenness, literally. Singleness, if it's unwanted. Um, an unwanted separation or divorce, having a, a prodigal partner or a child, so children that have walked away from the Lord, um, a partner who's walked away from the Lord, that can just go on and on and on. It can feel like a, a delay and waiting. Um, an unsaved partner or a child that have just, just have not had an encounter with the Lord. Um, I think I said lack of vision before. A long-term just desire for a house or a home to be nested, to belong somewhere. Um, and then just literally anything that comes into the realm of lack of breakthrough and lack of change. Is there anyone that has had an, or does have an area here that's a grating delay that's come up on the screen? Okay. If your hand didn't go up, take note. Your family members are in this journey. So take some notes about what we're doing today. And if your hand went up, I am still in there with you. My breakthrough has not happened yet, even though I've got a little glory home for me. Um, Proverbs 13 verse 12 acknowledges that hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when desire is fulfilled, it is a tree of life like a tree of life comes. When desire means desire, when desire fulfilled means it, it gets fulfilled. The second half of the sentence shows 
there's a change, there is a, there is a received, there is a tree coming for everybody. But the first half, what an acknowledgement. Hope deferred, to, to defer something is to put it aside and wait. Doesn't mean we have been put aside <laughs> by Jesus, but it can go on and on and on. And the fruit of that can be heart sickness, sickness of heart, which can really impact our faith, which can really impact our, our spiritual journey, our relationship with the Lord. But the word acknowledges that heart sickness can come in. That's even one area you can pray for each other or bring to Jesus. Jesus, would you just do something with this collecting pool of heart sickness? Um, yeah, it's, it's really painful. So there is purpose to delay. There is not one thing that we go through where there's long delay season that is out of God's complete attention. Complete attention. Every single day of waiting matters. Every single day of waiting matters. It has purpose and God is doing something in that. I felt for so long that I was just in the wilderness sowing seeds, in the wilderness sowing seeds, and there's just dry sand like everywhere. And I've been praying, worshiping Jesus, bowing. I'm going to get onto that. Seed, 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 seed. I never feel like that. And my pastor said to me, Oh, the trees don't grow in the wilderness, but every seed you sow is growing already in the promised land. So when we enter into it, that's why there's established trees. Because every prayer matters. Every hoping in Jesus again matters. Every holding on, even if it's by your fingernails, that produces another tree. It's just we haven't got to the received part yet, but it really, really matters. And he's so, so beautiful to make us more like Jesus that he's okay with, let's just see what gets revealed in the waiting. Ever tried to ask a toddler to wait? Can I have this? Oh, no. Hmm, that no didn't sound convincing. I'm going to try 342 more times. The purposes of delay. I'm not going to get into this as an entire teaching on waiting. I have done one before and the wilderness. I can send links for that. Because I hear Jesus telling me to go on a different track when it comes to waiting. And I want to introduce some of you to that today. So I don't want to go into a lot of detail with this list. But I do want to capture and acknowledge there's deep purpose in waiting. So some of the purpose of delay is to help with our divided heart with our unbelief. Next picture is of my dad and I. <laughs> At one season where I hit the wall with my faith and I went, mm, not so sure I can do this anymore. I was in South Africa. I'd just gone through a major um, relational miscarriage and Jessica caught this shot. Remember sometimes I've said in prophetic pictures, I can see Jesus and he has a checked shirt on. Isn't it precious when your dad teaches you Jesus? My Jesus often has a checked shirt on, thanks to what you've built on my heart. So thank you, Dad. Um, but I went through just complete, I don't know, I don't know if I want to live in delay. I don't know if I can live in delay. And, and my life is passing by. And so in this area, it was just deep grief that I don't have children, that I don't have a husband. And it's not because I'm sitting there going, I want to, these love feelings, I want to be, I feel complete. I am complete as a person. I'm happy as I am. I don't have extra need. But I was, I'm born so relational, so interpersonal, and had always dreamed into giving into that space under, under a roof. And every time there's just been coming along near a gentleman, the Lord has always said, wait or no, to me or to them. It's not been, the ones that didn't work out haven't been fighting or there's never been a problem. It's always wait and no. And to feel like there's actually purpose in that when your life is passing, like at 35 to grieve, I will never be a young mom and I'll never be a young bride. Like it's done, it's gone. And then to go, but he's got purpose in it, but it doesn't mean that there's no loss involved. And, and in this season, I think we went to church the next day. I couldn't even say a word. Have you ever been in worship and you're like, I can't speak 
to Jesus right now. And all my dad could do is just, you know, put his hand next to me and, and my mum. And the next day I went to a cafe on my own after my dad had bought me cake and top. I was like, buy me cake, buy me new clothes. So he did. <laughs> Mug and Bean Cafe in South Africa, eating all the keg. All the keg. Went through their list that week. But, um, and then again, it's like, what are we going to do with this? What are we going to do when the door is still closed? And some of you know this story. My father contacted a prophet, beautiful, prophetic, safe prophet in New Zealand, if we call people, you know, prophets, beautiful pastor who is highly prophetic, and, and asked him, can you ring my daughter? She needs help. He SOS'd another pastor. So the pastor Skypes in. I've never met him or seen him before. And he's like, I've been pondering on you all day. And Jesus wants to say that you have a divided heart. Oh, that's so encouraging. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, and he went on to just explain a little bit of it. I've had to work it out myself, but half of me believed in Jesus and half of me really rallied against Jesus. Half of me loved him. Half of me was like, you use me for ministry. That's why you've kept me single. So that I'm available. So that I can be used. And I had all this other stuff on the other half of my heart that I didn't know until it was really squeezed like a tire underneath the water. So when you put it under, the little air pockets come out. Well, this was a little like, what's in there moment? So I went back to my bedroom do you remember? Took my Bible, flipped it, bang, open to Psalm 88, 11 to 12. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart. I'd flipped the Bible to this. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart, not just half of it. I looked up that sentence in Google. There's only two times it's mentioned in the Bible like that. I think the other one's Isaiah. So it's not on every page. I flipped to him going, you're divided. So an area of waiting is because he's like, do all the parts of your heart love me, believe in me, trust me? Do they all trust me that I'm good and that I'm good to you? Does every part of our heart believe that? And that was the challenge he took me on. I ended up having some prayer ministry help and came up with 78 judgments I had against God. I didn't know they were in there. Put a squeeze on and there's some junk in there, guys. And I'm grateful because in the waiting, he's made me more like him. And in the waiting, I've received Jesus. But do we have a divided heart? Other purposes of delay can be sometimes to reveal a trigger in our hearts or unhealed places. Like if God says no, what happens in our heart? If there's no breakthrough, what does it trigger? Jesus doesn't know, like me, doesn't look after me, God doesn't notice me. Like what comes up? It also reveals sometimes judgments and especially against God, as I said, it can sometimes reveal to us our sin. Do you trust me? Sometimes the no or the wait reveals, do I actually trust him? It's a trust issue. All the time I've had to go, I believe you. I believe you. And let him really build that deeper and deeper and deeper. There has been so much unbelief. I wasn't here a couple of Sundays ago. Health journey. I had the worship song on that we sang first today. And I had it on repeat. Nicole had sent it to me. And there's this guy who's singing it. I don't know. I didn't watch the video. And he, he yells out, sings out one sentence. One sentence. And it's not actually part of the song. So we didn't sing it today. It's just his free worship. And his free worship song, when you listen to a song all day, means that that sentence becomes part of the song to you. And so I'm singing it out loud in my kitchen. And it's, you have a perfect track record. And I burst into tears and I went, oh, he just found another part of my heart that didn't believe that he has a perfect track record when it comes to me. I was so grateful. I didn't know there was a nut, but I cried and I'm like, yeah, that was painful. I don't know if I could say you have a perfect track record when it comes to your management of me. How beautiful that he found another piece and turned it forward. Is this Okay. 
Sometimes it's to bring us back to obedience and a, w- a willingness to obey. So sometimes it burns so much when there's no change that we actually start going, let me just look into my righteousness. Let me just start actually serving Jesus. Let me actually love him. Let me actually be doing the things in his word that he's asked me to do instead of some of the false refuges, instead of, you know, it brings us to the end of ourselves and our faith to come back to righteousness. Sometimes it's to bring us to a greater knowledge of Christ. I know Christ in ways I never would have have I had a family. I'm so grateful. Sometimes it's to strengthen our faith. I feel like I live with an anchor. I'm so grateful. It was built in the nothingness and in the lack and in the waiting. Sometimes it's to bring us to desperate dependence and to heart enlargement. Our heart enlarges us. We just choose him and we depend on him and he's the only thing we have. Have you got into that stage? Sometimes it's to bring us to a greater spiritual maturity. Sometimes it's to draw us into the word and to hearing his promises. If there's areas of delay, we need to get into the word or to get people praying for us to hear a rhema word, so a prophetic word or a rhema word that comes out of the Bible that actually jumps and goes, this is a promise for you from Jesus. We need them. And we need to put them on our mirror and in our car and on our table. And it needs to be our manner. Like, what are we eating? What are we eating in the delay, in the nothingness, the promised land? There's just over there, but it was 40 years, 40 years that they ate. What were they eating? God's provision. 24 hours. There's enough grace for 24 hours. Does your, has your heart learnt that there is enough grace for 24 hours? There's enough sustaining and enabling grace for 24 hours in your life all the time. And it's gotten to the point where I've had to do, I'm just doing 24 hours. I did that for quite a while. I can't do tomorrow. I can't look ahead. It's so black. Temptations towards death are here. I can do 24 hours because there's enough because that's what manna is. You couldn't save the manna for the next day. It would go off. You couldn't gather it, but it would always be there. There really is enough. And all of you sitting here have a 100% track record of choosing life. Proves there's enough. There's enough grace. Do we know how to eat the word? Sometimes it's to bring us into a place of greater dependence and brokenness. A broken and contrite heart. It loves the brokenness is beautiful. It makes us more like Jesus. He is the potter. We are the clay. I've had to acknowledge sometimes when it's a bit of a burn Yeah, but I'm not quite like Jesus, so this is fair. It's actually a sentence I say. It's like, okay, that sucked. That was more grief, or that was loneliness, or that was, no, I'm not like you, so mm, that's fair. Keep working on my heart, keep breaking me down, keep building me up. It's unto Christ-likeness. It's always got a purpose. Sometimes it's to catapult us into another dimension in God, like we learn new things about him. That's been some of my story. Sometimes it's to reveal his love for us. Like he has just, when it comes to gifts, I also am a gift person. I say that I've got, if someone says, what's your love language? I, I list them all. I'm like, oh. I just love them all. And a couple of extra ones I've found. But... Um, <laughs> But when it comes to gifts, when he gives you like your true heart's desire, you go, he really knows me. That's what I learned today with my, uh, with this year with my house. I'm like, he really, really knows me. Which is beautiful for my heart to learn because I didn't know that, not at that level. Sometimes it's to give us a greater sense of compassion for others when we're broken. We're like, whoa, we just notice broken people and we're like, I'll come in and cuddle you. It really helps, yeah. Suffering, I just love the theology of suffering. I'm not like, all like suffering. I'm not addicted to pain, blah, blah, blah. I don't like have black skulls at home in my house. But um, I, it's, it, there is a theology, there, there is suffering in the word. And it always has purpose. And I love learning that and journeying near people who have suffering. And that's only because of what he has chosen for my life, which I'm so grateful for. Sometimes it's to restore real Christianity, like you can't do fake when you're really, really broken. And for a church, you know, we can go through things corporately. It's like, let's, let's scare real. Sometimes it's to reveal, it's supposed to be a, a capital H, his glory. 
In short, it's most usually to make us more like Jesus. It really has so much purpose. And if we just go, well, I'm not quite like him, it just kind of makes it all okay. Sometimes, for an hour. So, how do we face delay? Because he's saying, I want my people to just come back and face delay. Not just get through with delay. Not just keep delay nearby. Face delay. So, my thoughts, Amy's little theology, when it comes to facing delay and suffering, are two things. Bowing and tapping. So, bowing, what is a bow? Let me go like this. So, it's a posture. Remember that. Bowing is a posture. And the Lord really honors bowing. I'll get on to tapping in a minute because that's the one he's going, can we just do some tapping over here, paradox? Bowing is yielding. What he's taught me in the secret place, in the long-term waiting and delay, and especially when there was other lack and, and trauma that I was in, which I'm just not in now, even though my season hasn't changed, I'm really content and happy. But in that season, bowing was something he kept asking me to do. What is bowing? It's yielding to the process. It's going, this is delay. This is suffering in you. This has purpose, and I will yield to it. Have you ever tried to take a prickle out of a child's foot? Many times in Africa, we were lying on the floor like this with our parents, and they had a needle. I tell you what, if you just submit to the process, it's a lot better for everybody then if you don't. Not submitting to this extraction of unrighteousness is messy when you're like <laughs> against the needle. Submitting, yielding, lying still with your foot there and going, I trust you. Can we be still in delay? It really reveals our anger. I've had to go through lots of anger, which is part of grief but can we be still? Bowing is quietening our heart. It's leaning into his promises. It's yielding to his plans and knowing this is in him. This is, we're not lost here, not lost. There's no such thing biblically. None of you are lost. You're not lost. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly where you are and he knows exactly what he's doing in you. It's all in time. It's all in time. Nothing's out of time here. It's all going to come into restoration. But we need to lean into the promises and yield to his plan and his timing and it being out of control. Some of us battle with things being out of our control. But that's kind of the point. Because when it's out of your control, it's in his control. But do we trust that it's in anyone else's control when it's out of our control? Or do we just freak out and go into chaos and fear? If I'm not in control, dot, dot, dot. Ask Jesus what your heart believes. A bit, bit scary. Got to get that one out. Get that sucker out. Hold the foot up. <laughs> Release control. I don't know when this is going to change. I don't know when it's going to get better. I don't know how it's going to get better. You are strong and I am weak. You are big and I am little. Bowing, yielding. He, the Lord, really honors bowing. And he asks us to have what's called expectant hope. This is really painful. You can have hope. Oh, yes, I have hope. I believe in Jesus. Expectant hope is taking all the parts of your heart that really are wrestling and battling with this delay and going, I'm going to hold it right out here and hope and believe in you completely. Expectant hope means we're putting our hope into faith that it will change. That's really scary. It's so vulnerable it's so vulnerable to sit with our heart open to expect and hope every day. And I've done a lot of it, and things haven't changed. Like that expect and hope has had some heart sickness, <laughs> like years and years of choosing to have it out here. And you know what? He's told me that's worship. That is worship unto him. It says something about him that we would still hold our heart out, and it's 20 years, 40 years but he's asking for expectant hope, not just I will harden my heart and toughen up to get through this because I believe in you, so I'm going to get through this and become a cement figurine on a surfboard. I don't know why that picture just came to my head, but maybe it's for one of you. But he's like, no, don't let your heart turn to stone. Hold it out here and have expectant hope. That's bowing. 
it's very vulnerable. And it doesn't mean, it's not a, it's not a coin that gets the thing turning. It doesn't mean it'll change because you're doing it. You just do it because he's beautiful. Isaiah 64 verse 4 says, Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. When we wait, he's active. When we're trying to get things going in our own strength, we're active. And he's like, okay, I'm just going to wait for you to crash and burn. (laughs) When we wait, it feels like nothing's happening. It really feels like nothing's happening. But the scripture says that he's acting on our behalf if we wait. He's our Boaz. He's our kingsman redeemer. Naomi said to Ruth, just rest. Boaz won't rest until he has settled this. Sometimes in my head, I just put my head on Naomi's lap. If you think I'm weird, go speak to Jesus. But I just, I just do that and I go, my Boaz is active while I'm resting. Like he's my kingsman redeemer. He is not going to rest. Like he literally does not stop. Does every part of our heart know that he isn't waiting to? He's not waiting. He's doing. He is so busy. Do you know that? He is so busy in the areas of your delay. But the key to action some of that busyness is so long as he's not busy trying to get you out of your chaotic, wait. He acts on behalf of the one who waits. So how to do that? We run after him with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength, and we pursue Jesus. I love this book by Bob Sorge. I've had maybe three books that have helped me the most through waiting. There's a bunch more that I've read, but there's three top ones. This one is The Fire of Delayed Answers. Isn't it a fire? The Fire of Delayed Answers by Bob Sorge. This one is just packed with theology around waiting. So this one's not so much in, you know, his life story, although he says a couple of things. I just love it because it's just... Everything in the scripture, you know, there's so many delays. There's jails, there's caves, there's fires. There's just so much in the scripture and he really unpacks it and God's heart for us in it. It's just been my favorite book. Another one is written by, do you know Jody? Not Sample McPherson, Jody. Erickson Tata, thank you. The one who, when she was like 17, 18, she dived into water and broke her neck. And it's only because her sister turned around going, oh, there's a crab, that she saw her sister lying face down in the water, dragged her out and her neck was broken. And that she's now... 60 something and she has this huge ministry for people who are disabled and her latest book oh my gosh it's called The Healing Place and she's still not healed she's referring to her wheelchair that the delay of healing yes healing is biblical so she believes that completely and people always come up to her must be your sin must be your sin can I pray for you you mustn't have faith enough that you're still in a wheelchair but she keeps talking about the Christ likeness and the place of healing and all he's done in her heart when she's been trapped in delay trapped literally can't move from the neck down paralyzed she's married she's pain shoots through even though she's paralyzed in the night but she can't turn herself she lives in chronic pain. The, the chronic pain just started this last season. It's been part of my story. So it's just been beautiful to read. But she calls her chair the place of healing. That's what waiting does. We learn that the gift was in the waiting. The gift's inside the delay. So beautiful. So Bob Sorge says, waiting is aggressive repose, stopping aggressively. I love his oxymorons. Waiting is a stationary... So it, Stationary pursuit. I'm pursuing Jesus by doing nothing intentionally. It's not passive. See the oxymoron there? Um, Waiting is intense stillness. I'm so still intensely, intentionally out of my bowing. Waiting is vigilant listening. Just do nothing intentionally. Um, bowing, waiting, and yielding is not acquiescence. Do you know that, what that word means? To acquiesce is the reluctant acceptance of something without prote- protest. 
okay, I'll just acquiesce and give up. So I'm talking about bowing and yielding. I'm not talking about going, okay, well, I'll just give up until he changes his mind. Sentences that are acquiescence is, it is what it is. Have you ever said that? That's agreements with hopelessness and helplessness. That's acquiescence. It just is like this. When we acquiesce, it's different to bowing. Acquiesce is bad. Acquiescing is, I'm just going to come up with ways to manage my heart and my life to put up with the season I'm in. That's, com- that's giving in to the season. That's, that's just choosing. It's not going to change. So how, what am I going to do to survive this? That's acquiescence. I didn't believe there was acquiescence in my heart until this year in my bowing. So I've actually had my best year yet, ever, seriously. There's been no breakthroughs on some levels, but I've never been so alone physically. Like, being unwell, I just used to be out every night. I'm home a lot and had a lot of time off work, and then I've gone more part-time. I'm just alone all the time, like, all the time. And I'm so happy. I just feel him, and I'm because this deep contentedness that I'm like... I'm so grateful that I got this breakthrough before any other breakthrough. Like, deep sweetness. I'm like, I just love my home and I just sit on my couch and I stare at my kitchen and I'm like, I love you. And then the next day I walk out of my room, I'm like, oh, I live in a hotel. This is just wonderful. Jesus bought me a hotel. But I just love being in my little hotel by myself. And deep contentedness. And then September, October, it's like, what is this feeling? This is a new feeling. I think this is joy. And joy from having a joyful personality or joy of the hope for the future is one thing. But when you've gone through long-term suffering and then you have a joy that comes up that only he can do in you and then you really feel this deep well of joy, it's like what a thing to have at the end of nothingness and still no breakthrough, but to have contentedness and joy. I, I could have missed that. How sweet. And then, this last month, grief. It's end of year. Things didn't change. I'm like, no, not the grief. I love my contentedness. I want to be alone. And God's like, but I designed you for other things. I designed you for a relationship and for children. And so I haven't had a Christmas tree up for many years because it's too painful. Because there's no one at home. But this year I put up a tree and I cried when I did it. But I have a tree. And I've bowed into the grief again, and I've allowed it to just wash through me. I'm kind of like, ah, oh, I miss that contentedness. But I've been allowing it to wash through me. And then I'm like, ah, oh, this feels like more than just giving into it. This feels, like I'm, this feels like I'm bowing into it, like giving up kind of thing. So I did contact my prime minister in America, and we did have a session. And I'm not going to unpack the whole thing for you at all. I'll show you the next picture. The Lord showed me prophetically that I was underwater in a way that I couldn't breathe long term. So I'm 17 years into waiting in my delay. Some of you, it was way longer. But he showed me that a part of my heart, not all of my heart, but a part of my heart had given up and is way, way, way down, like way down at the bottom of the ocean. And in two days, he did a deep prophetic work to find a part of my heart that had turned from life, which I never knew, and had acquiesced. And in that place, there was apathy. I'm like, ah, oh, that's the part of me that struggles to just fight for my health and pray this. And I can fight for other people, but I feel like sometimes there's a part of me that's a bit apathetic and passive and isn't a fighter, isn't in offense. I'm just more in defense. I'm here and I love you, Jesus. But where's my fight? I feel like some of us are in that place. When we came and we did a few weeks ago the praying for people who are unwell and we stood in a circle, that was very special, really powerful. It was really tricky for people to get into prayer. I stood there and I went, I don't know if we've got an an offense church. Like when it comes to fighting and going forward, something's missing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what have we done? And I felt there's just some apathy. There's some, it is what it is. And there's some, it's tricky and it's hard, but I believe Jesus and trust lead Jesus, but I'm going to lean back into coping, coping with my life. Instead of allowing him to show those pieces of come into helplessness and hopelessness and to get my sword back and lean back forward. So he did a restoring in me. I had a lot of sin to repent for in that place and turned back to life in that place. And he, he found me under the water. Um, and my fighter is back. <laughs> but 
But I didn't know that to acquiesce is really, it sits so close to yielding. So be careful of that. I am watching the time, but we're just going to keep going. Is that okay? Thanks. Tapping. So he's been talking to me about tapping, which is asking persistently for our inheritance. He said to me, I love your bowing. That's really cute, beautiful. You've done it for many years. You're a yielder. There's some acquiescence in there. Let's deal with that. And he's like, where's your nagging thing? Where's your banging on the door? And I literally remember back in my, my old rental, sometimes even my prayer with the Lord, I was banging on a, on a door. Like I remember I used to bang in areas of breakthrough. And I'm like, I guess part of me doesn't bang and tap anymore. And so I did this thing. I flipped my Bible and it landed to Luke. I don't do this all the time, just, you know, when it matters. It landed to Luke chapter 18 and it was the Passion Translation. I'm going to read it to you. One day, Jesus taught the apostles to keep praying and never stop or lose hope. Can I do that sentence again? He taught the apostles to keep praying. Are we keeping praying, people? Keep is a, you know, and keeping, I-N-G, constant. Keeping praying and never stopping and never losing hope. He shared with them this illustration. In a certain town, there was a civil judge, a thick-skinned and godless man, so not Jesus, who had no fear of others' opinions. And there was a poor widow in that town who kept pleading with the judge, grant me justice and protect me against the oppressor. He ignored her pleas for quite some time, but she kept asking. Eventually, he said to himself, oh, this widow keeps annoying me, demanding her rights. I'm tired of listening to her. So the toddler thing. Even though I'm not a religious man and I don't care about the opinions of others, I'll just get her off my back by answering her claims for justice. And I'll rule in her favor. Then she'll leave me alone. The Lord continued, did you hear what the ungodly judge said, that he would answer her? Persistent request. Not he'll answer her request. He'll answer her persistent request. Don't you know that God, the true judge, will grant justice to all of his chosen ones who cry out to him night and day? He will pour out his spirit upon them. He will not delay. Hoo-hoo, there's our word. He will not delay to answer you and give you what you ask for. No more delay. God will give swift justice to those who don't give up. So be ever praying, ever expecting, just like the widow was with the judge. Yet when the Son of Man comes back, will he find this kind of persistent faithfulness in his people? And I chose to look at the footnote underneath. Luke 18, verse 7, translated from the Aramaic text, the Greek text has an unusual verb that means ever tapping, signifying one who keeps knocking on the door of heaven until he receives what he came for. And I feel Jesus is going, tapping reveals us just like bowing reveals us. Because now I was like, I don't know if I can tap. That's expectant hope. I'll just bow. I'll be passive. Active, I believe this is the season. Remember, Rachel said it could be three weeks, it could be three months, it could be three years. It's not going to finish on the 31st of December. We're in a season of receiving. might be February when you get your breakthrough. But the fact is, do we trust him enough to tap? It revealed my trust of him again. And now literally... It's a good thing I'm alone. I tap on things like literally. I tap on the doors. I tap when I'm driving. I'm tapping on the table. And it just helps me pray as I go. I'm like, give me my inheritance. That's what I do. Give me my inheritance. Give me my inheritance. And I'm just doing it all day long. I'm said, you said tap, so I'm going to tap. Here's my toddler. I'm the toddler. Give it to me now. And he's actually asking for that kind of requesting. Like, well, this is this language is all persistent, persistent, ongoing. I'm like, ah, oh, you said it, you asked for it, here it comes. So I've been tapping like literally and it's helping me pray out loud and it's revealed another side of me that we would ask. What does asking reveal in you? Do you feel like when you ask, you'll receive? Do you feel like when you ask, you get, someone's gonna be cross with you? Like what does asking reveal? So I've been tapping. He's asking us to tap if we haven't had the breakthrough. Thank you for bowing, he's saying. I'm wanting some asking. Tapping reveals us as much as waiting does. It's persistent knocking. It's declaring with full heart belief, not just words. 
like Job 22, thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established. It's striking the ground, like in 2 Kings 13, where Elisha is with the king Jehoash, and he's like, strike the ground. Strike the ground with the arrow. Okay, shoot one arrow out the east window. Okay, I'm telling you, here's your promise. You're going to win the fight. There we go, you got your promise. But now that you've had your promise, strike the ground. So some of us have had promises, but he's like, now strike the ground now that you've had a promise. So he strikes it three times, and the He's angry. He's like, why didn't you do five? Why didn't you do six? Why didn't you do persistent tapping? Why is it short? Why do you not trust? It's praying, it's praying on repeat and checking, like for clouds, for rain. First Kings 18.42, we have Elijah and his servant regarding the rain before getting to Jezreel. And he's like, is there rain? No. Is there rain? No. Is there rain? No. Is there rain? No. That's called tapping. Okay, let's start getting into offense and move forward and let's start crying out. Do I have time to tell you a couple of testimonies in our church? Family, is that all right? So, I think my sound went off on my microphone. You're an amazing team. Thanks for tracking with me. So, we gave these out and they pinched some people's hope. It wasn't easy. Uh, Bethia made a frame. So that's the first picture I'm going to show you. She put hers in a frame and she wrote out. Like that's, that's engaging with the, the word. And she wrote out what she wanted the most. And on the far left, in particular, for her marriage to be restored. And I'm not sure how many of you know that things went south for them in complete Jesus way. Jesus was like, okay, the way to restore this is to undo it altogether. So they went through separation for a lot of this year, lived in different houses, single parenting, very traumatic for them. And at the end of this year, Brett has his card and he has said, I've kept my received envelope with me at all times. No more delay in every part of my life, but how can I go past no more delay than my marriage fully restored? Deeper connection with my wife, being more of a father to my children. I'm so thankful for the season. Hardest season yet, but deepest and rich. So thankful. So much more to say, but this pick here says it all. Love you, family, for walking it through with us. Isn't that beautiful? One of their Life Hub leaders is Jessica Talbot, and she said, it took me a couple of months to have the courage to take a received envelope from the info table beginning of this year, a couple of months. I eventually took one during my prayer room session. This is due to multiple crash dreams in my heart that I was afraid to hope again. One dream was that I got... Uh, one great thing is that I got a good job for the year. But another is I thought I needed $80,000 deposit for a house, so I'd written off ever being able to save enough to go down that route. But this year, the Lord provided a way where I only needed about $5,000. Unbelievable to me. I now have provisional finance that at this rate, my slab will be laid in February. The company actually came back with no to her. The house you have changed and done all these things to is worth more than the amount we want to lend you. So she got a knockback. She, she was over by forty, forty, fifty thousand dollars So she got knocked back. I said, you take that envelope with you <laughs> into that meeting. So she went back into the meeting four days later and they said, oh, here's a different house design or designer or I don't know what they'd done. It looked exactly the same. It had everything she wanted except some things that were better. And they said, but this one's $40,000 cheaper. And so it's been submitted. She just got 40 grand taken off her loan. She just chose. I got a knockback, but tapping, bowing. So isn't that a beautiful testimony? <laughs> mm. The financial one, Grant. Mine has stayed in my wallet, and it's been the most pro profitable year we've ever experienced in 25 years of business. The Lord has blessed us more than we could have ever imagined. It's beautiful. Rod and Lindley have spent 30 years on the mission field and throughout that time um, rented and um, didn't have a heap and God always provided. We always had enough, just, just enough. Um, but throughout that time, the, it wasn't enough for them to have like future covering and future plans. 
And the Lord just kept saying to them, I'm going to look after you. I'm going to look after you. And then more recently, prophetic words unto that. And my mom in particular had a grief throughout all those years just for a home um, and a home one day. She was always a good homemaker, always had a, a nicely kept home, but not her own home. And so a few weeks ago, she just said to me, it's like there's blockage for our family, like there's a holding yard, like for Jess and I in particular and and for my parents. She's like, it's like something's stuck. A couple of days later, they were contacted by a couple who knew, you know, of all their mission work and involvement and and just tracked with them a bit and said, it'll be our investment house, but we want to build you the house of your dreams, anything you want, everything you could ever dream of, and you live in it until you one day go into an old age home and mortgage free for the rest of your life. Isn't that precious? God is doing it. I just want to give you some some examples. Um, Kara is not here today. Daniel is. Where's Daniel? Yeah. Daniel's the one who's building building out there and making it so beautiful. And we love having him around. He's a safe person to have every day nearby. Him and his wife, similar to Brett and Bethia, high trauma. They went through trauma when they went south. Horrific. Um, and horrific damages on their marriage. And even when we were in the old building, not even the chapel, but where we were in Quinana, our times there were um, praying for you guys, but particular because barrenness has been part of your story after your first son. And Kara just often came up for prayer for that, and there just hasn't been a breakthrough. But she went, I received the gift of connection back to my heart this year. She said, that's what I received. Isn't that beautiful? God has healed some deep inner wounds and laid new foundations in both Daniel and I. We literally have a new marriage and relationship together. Oh, and God's opened my barren womb and we're expanding our family. (laughs) She did write a poem the day she found out she was pregnant, and I have it here, but for time I might put that in the comments section as well when we release this post. But we're so proud of you. Well done. That's been a big breakthrough for you this year. There hasn't been breakthrough for some of us. I'm, I'm like, it's the end of the year, and, you know, there's some of us, and you're sitting here, and I'm with you, um, and there's others that have just not had breakthroughs throughout the year, and can I just invite you up briefly, Kathleen and Jeffrey, because, yeah, the breakthrough hasn't been seen all through the year. Hey, guys. Um, yeah, well, for us, our promise from God has been a family, our inheritance, and um, God spoke to us about that eight years ago. We've been married nine years now, Um, and he spoke that over our lives, our family over our lives, so we've been believing for our family, and we've received our beautiful son, Ryan, um, in that time, but we felt that there's more, and that's been the promise we've been waiting on. So that's our delay, but the journey has been eight years, and so even though that's, it's about children, it's actually for me, (laughs) but it's been a a story of barrenness. when Jeff and I um, came together, I already had a journey of delay of waiting for him for 10 years um, and some other, an accident that I'd been involved in that um, had caused a lot of trauma. So when we finally came together, within three months, I had chronic fatigue. I just literally fell on the floor and I was like, I'm done. It was like my mind hit its end and my heart was like, I can't do this anymore. And so I was fine. I was like, yeah, I'm all good. I just can't do anything. I can't go out. I can't do anything. And so that's um, what this man has walked with me to literally resurrect me, to, to go from death to life, from barrenness to fruitfulness. And so for God to speak his breath into that place in us and say, this is your promise, this is your inheritance. That's actually the journey that we've been on for for eight years now. Um, A month ago was eight years. And so we've walked with you guys for probably a year and a half, so you haven't seen that side, but um, 
yeah, literally I've come from the ground and it's it's like Jeffrey, the way I see it is he just, I'm on the ground and he just made a way for me and called me up. And so it was my job to turn into him. Um, and it was his job to call me up. Um, so I didn't bring my notes, but... I feel like there's several things. He's, he's brought us together as husband and wife. He's made us into mothers and fathers. And yes, that's about our gorgeous son who through IVF we were able to conceive. Um, and for me to, to become a mother at that stage, it was like, again, it was about children, but it was, it was more than that. Um, for Jeff with fatherhood, do you want to share a little bit? Uh, it was when we were travelling Australia when Kathleen said, okay, it's time to start a family. And um, there, was, there was something in my heart that, that could, I, I couldn't hear it. And it's not now until I'm in paradox with the language that I now understand that the, the, the ability to say yes to fatherhood God was going to bring that out of a dead place in my heart. And it was a place that I, I didn't even know was dead. So you can't bring that to God if you don't even know it's there. I wasn't in denial, I just didn't, it wasn't there. And so in, in, in a, about a, a three-week period, I come to the place where I said to Kathleen, I can't say yes to it. I can't. I, there's nothing in my heart that I can, I can enter into that. And so that was a, a point of confession and we prayed. And like faith, when you confess and you pray and you bring it into the light, the faith came in an instant. It was like one moment I can't, next moment I can. Like, yes, let's do it. <laughs> yes. And the faith was put in me, the the. The anointing of God was put in me. I'm like, I felt God on it. I'm like, wow, we're going to be, we're going to be mums and dads next month. <laughs> well, look out. Um, but that was the start. That was a seed. Faith comes by a seed. Mm. And so for me, um, motherhood was more an extending my tail. I was ready. I'm like, make me a mother. Um, but God said to me, will you mother my people? And... As I said that, we were in the process of IVF and I just knew, I'm like, we're going to have a son. And we were pregnant and we had children. Anyway, keep going. We're, we came to this beautiful family who, um, you know, it, it, there's just so much that family brings. There's so much that corporate brings because um, in vulnerability, you know, what's mine is yours, what's yours is mine. I'm fighting for you and you're fighting for me and we're standing as a team and saying, Phew. We're going to get this together because victory is the only answer. And so um, earlier this year, we felt to share with our life. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> that what our promise was, you know, we have a beautiful son, but he has more for us. And probably the big thing was that, you know, we've got this beautiful little IVF boy and we just felt in our hearts that, to go IVF again is not the promise that he has put in our hearts. And when you have a son that you've had so much trouble conceiving, you just think, why, why, why would you not do IVF again? And yet that was, it just did not line up with the promise that God had spoken over us. And so we wanted to be accountable, we wanted to be vulnerable, we wanted um, to journey with people. And so that's what we've done. And, you know, we'd go with our envelopes around the circle and come to me and... <laughs> Not yet, <laughs> not yet. We're not pregnant yet. But there was this, this, this thing in my heart and it's just, I'm expectant. It's not yet, but I'm expectant. And so it's just, you know, it seems messy, but there's just something there that says the victory is here. Anyway, um, so a bit like you actually, towards the end of the year, you know, it's getting close. Like, we got these envelopes. We're standing there as well going, yeah, 
it's over, people. Delay is done, you know? And, and we get to two months ago and I'm like, the year is nearly done and delay is still here. What the heck? And it just... It took both of us, it's like it's on our, in separate ways, taking us to our end where we're just, you know, prior to that, it's like I could go, it's all good, you know, God's got this, it's my faith that's going to bring us through. And it's like it just everything stripped away where it's like, but God, but God. And oh, there's so many stories I can tell from the last eight weeks to go off every point up there, not every bit, lots <laughs> But um, we went to IVF again as a an option, just to say, is this is this the way God speak to us? And it was it was again. I came out, and it was like I just went, no, I. I, I we can't go that way. So it was like God had brought us to this point and he'd been saying now, all year, now, it's now, it's now, no more delay. So it was like to my left, I'm like, I say no to, to waiting next month, next month. But I also say no to IVF. And so it was like the only posture that I could have is to stand and go, King Jesus, King Jesus. And it's like my heart. My mind had come to its end. If we don't do IVF, there is nothing I can do. Nothing. And it's like my heart was like, this is just out of control. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. And my spirit went, you determine my inheritance. (laughs) I'm pregnant. So Kathleen is is six weeks pregnant, and um, when we were asked to share that, I thought, well, this is actually quite quite actually inappropriate to speak this out in a public setting. Um, but as we pro- because we have a seed of promise, we don't have a baby. Everybody knows that a pregnancy is a pregnancy, and then you have a baby born. So to speak this out in a public place um, was confronting, um, but we knew that our journey had crossed into a corporate journey when we shared with the Life Hub. And then the understanding came that this is about justice, and justice is served in a court that is open to the public. So for for the people that have, for us, this has been a a stepping out onto a limb that that will break under our weight unless God holds us up. It's jumping off the top of a mountain with a wingsuit. It's, I spoke with um, guys in the um, worship tonight, this morning, and they just, Language there, stepping out as stepping across a doorway into the dark night. It's those types of things, and we're asking that the justice of God will come to this place. Like, we left Queensland uh, one year after we were married, and it was a, both a dream to um, when we did finally get married that we would do a working holiday around Australia. Before we left, he asked us, if you find a place that you seem to fit in, are you willing to stay? And we have found this place here. 
So we know that our journey from past to now is also for this place. So we are, we are in our sharing of where we are now is for this place. It's justice and it's promises now. Amen. Congratulations. We're going to pray protection over that pregnancy as well, that there'll be no backlash for speaking that out. Amen. Blessings and protection over your womb. Well done for fighting. I know the stance. It could be that it's something you're waiting for. It could be of a heart posture. I don't know what your waiting is. Sherelle says, I remember at the beginning of the year sometime, Grant was away fishing. So I was with Jess, Bethia, Wendy, and we ended up praying for one another. When it came to my turn to sit in the hot seat, they asked what I would like prayer for. And if, after a few seconds, what came out of my mouth was a surprise. I asked for courage. And it's been given to me time and time again this year. And ho, oh, how I love courage. So... It doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is. The Lord's literally going. I, there's, the end of the year is not yet, and he's wanting us to plunder December. Plunder December for each other, yes. But more importantly, can you choose to rise up and plunder your own inheritance? That's what, that's what he's asking for. Yes, we corporate. Yes, we pray for each other. Can you plunder your own inheritance by tapping, by asking, by pressing in? And if it goes into January, there's still, it's still in the season. And then February, but we're going to see each other through, yeah? So if anyone needs to fetch their children, they're welcome to, and the kids are welcome to be back in here. But can we just do some prayer? It's a bit 20 past 12, but are you open to that? Or let's stand in prayer, and if you need to sneak out, you sneak out. I'm going to lead us through some prayer. I felt that the Lord wanted us to start by repenting for acquiescence. If part of our heart has gone into, oh, I'm being faithful by just resting in here in an apathetic way to survive, that's different to, to bowing or tapping. So let's just ask Jesus. Jesus, have any of us given up? Or are there parts of our hearts that are divided and have given up while the other part still worships you? We sing to you this morning and there's another part that's dead. Jesus, you know where those parts of our heart are. Or you go, would you go to those places now, Jesus, and reveal them to us? Jesus, would you go after our unbelief? We thank you that delay reveals unbelief. We're sorry that there's unbelief. Jesus, we're sorry. Jesus, we're sorry for unbelief, for doubt. Can we repent for doubt? He so gets why we were tempted and why we went down that route. He so gets it. But Lord, we repent for doubt. Jesus, can you tell us if there's any part of our heart that has turned from life, even a shadow of a turning to survive, to cope with what we're in? If any part of us has turned even a shadow of a turning, that's called agreements with death. Jesus, if any part of our heart has felt they couldn't cope here and we've turned a bit from life, from the situation we're in that we're stuck in, from the unrelenting, unchanging season, Jesus, we repent from turning from life to cope. And we choose that every part of our heart come out of agreement with darkness, the kingdom of darkness, and the false comfort of death. We call him false comfort of death. And we renounce that relationship. We renounce that covenant. We renounce that false refuge to cope in the dark. So we come out of agreement with darkness right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, people. We come out of agreement with darkness, with doubt, with disillusionment. Is there disillusionment in their people? Jesus, would you go after disillusionment? And what did disillusionment do? Did it turn from life? Jesus, we repent for any part of us that has curled up to cope, for any part of us that has acquiesced, that has curled up in the fight because it's the only way through. It's what we believe, or it's safer, or it's 
Some of you have long-term been prayers, like declarative, declaring prayers, like you've done it and you haven't seen change yet. And I feel Jesus is telling you every single tree is there in the promised land. Your inheritance is untouched. All those prayers mattered. It wasn't a waste. Every single prayer is caught and is produced fruit. And he's encouraging you, will you, will you pray again? Will you open that part of your heart up where there's disillusionment and hopelessness? Jesus, would you go after hopelessness right now and helplessness? We repent for coming into agreement with hopelessness and helplessness. And we renounce the lie that it is what it is and the judgment on life that it is what it is and coming into acquiescence in that place and death in that place. We renounce that. And Father, we repent of any ways we've coped, any inner vows to shut down or to turn from life or to turn our hearts off or to turn to things to feed us, to false refuges. Jesus, whatever the coping mechanisms are, would you show them to us this week? even now, but in the, as we go forward, and on behalf of our heart, all of our heart, we repent for those ways of coping. We just repent for those ways of coping in hopelessness and despair and the length and in heart sickness. Jesus, would you come out of after every part of our heart where there's heart sickness? Right now, Jesus, would you come with your healing balm of Gilead and just go to that place of heart sickness, Jesus? And Lord, I ask for life in every area of the heart where there's been death, disillusionment, despair, hopelessness. Jesus, we can't do the rest of this delay season without You cleaning out the death. So we've renounced all of that. We bring that to death on the cross right now in the Name of Jesus, all that hopelessness. We come out of agreement with the spirit of death and we bring all that to death on the cross. But Jesus, I pray now that You would grant life, living streams of water to every part of our heart, Lord, that has had despair. Would You just break the power of despair in the Name of Jesus? Would You break the power of despair and the lies that come with despair? Would You come and break the lies? that there's no way through, there's no way through, there's no way out, it always will be like this. That's, that's a fearful and bitter expectation. We renounce all fearful and bitter expectations of the future being hard. And we repent for judging life. If any of us have judged life, we've judged life as hard or horrible or bad. We just renounce those judgments in Jesus' Name. Life is a gift and the giver is good. Let's say that. Life is a gift and the giver is good. And I choose to receive life in every part of my heart. Come on. I choose life. I choose to hope. Come on. I choose to hope in every area where there's a lack of breakthrough. I take a hold of hope and I hold it vulnerably as expectant hope before Jesus. I choose life. I choose hope. I choose faith. I choose to come back into offense instead of sleeping in defense. I choose to walk forward. I choose to tap. I choose to, to demand my inheritance as Jesus loves us to do. I choose to ask. I choose to ask. I choose to trust. I choose to trust again in every part of our hearts where there's, there's just deep distrust. Jesus, would you just come and build trust in on our behalf? We should just come to every part of our heart that struggles to trust and build that in on your behalf, Jesus. Would you build it in? Build it in. We choose trust. We choose faith. We choose promises. We choose to go again and again and again until it rains. Until it rains. And we will see everyone through because Jesus has said in this season, there is no more delay. And He doesn't say, accept this person and this person because that's too hard for me. His blood is enough. His blood is enough. He already did it at the cross. You will rally. You will live. You will live again. You will come through. You will thrive. Victory is your only, only inheritance biblically. There is no other outcome but, but victory. Yeah. 
And if this is your story and you've just repented of those things and, and professed some new ways of believing, if you'd love some prayer for you and standing with you in your delay season, please just come and fill all the carpets in the central area. And can anyone else who has had breakthrough, has now is now pregnant, is now in relationship, is now as a house, is now, if there's anything that you've had the breakthrough or you're just in our community and you just love these people, can you just come and stand with them and proclaim the truth, proclaim the Word? So if you want prayer, just come forward. If you're in delay, I'm going to stand in the middle too. If you're in delay, just come, come join me. You've just declared and now we're going to get fought for. For the rest of you, the Lord bless you and keep you, make His face shine upon you, be gracious to you and give you peace. If you have any might of courage in you, would you come and pray for us? Those who are not in the circle, I invite anyone who gave their life up to the Lord as up to yesterday. Will you come and lay hands and stand? Your prayers are enough, even if all you can say is Jesus, 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 Jesus. Come on. Come on down. Come on. Put your brave on. That's it. Hannah had her received this year. You better be praying for someone. Oh, me. <laughs> Yeah, just check around you if there's anyone who hasn't. Come, come, Gordon, come, Marika. Just check if there's anyone without hands on them. Karen, you're a mighty woman. Come on. Um, make sure everyone's covered. Everyone. And let's get bold in our praying and feel free to go into prophecy. Come on. They need rhema words to stand on. Let's go. You can ask them what they're praying for. Ask them. Ask them. Go for it. <laughs>